morning, everybody. Welcome to our update on our Commons test and trial. We'll just wait a couple more minutes uh, for people to enter and then we'll kick off. I can still see people coming in, so we'll just give it another moment or two and then we'll get going. 7.33. Well, we're recording. <laughs> I think you could hear that. We're recording um, this evening's webinar. So uh, for people who aren't able to attend, we can share that, this afterwards. Or if you enjoyed it so much, you want to watch it again, uh, you'll be able to do that. We'll send it out after the, after the webinar. So just a few introductions and then um, we'll give you an overview of what we're going to be doing this evening. So my name's Jo Swires and I am the facilitator for the ELM test and trial on Commons, which is obviously funded by DEFRA and being managed by the Foundation for Common Land and the Federation of Cumbria Commoners. I'll give you a bit of housekeeping stuff in a moment, but while we're on introductions, uh, I'll just tell you who else is going to be speaking tonight. So I'll just whiz down the list. We've got Viv Lewis, you're at the top of my screen, Viv. Yeah. Thanks, Viv. And then we've got Julia Aglianby. Hiya, Julia. We've got, and we've got Mike Dyke, who is um, from H&H &H Land and Estates. He's going to be joining us and talking to us too. Thanks, Mike. So uh, just a little bit of housekeeping, because there's going to be quite a lot, there's quite a lot of us on the call tonight. Um, this is the third of these webinars that we've done. So we've been practicing as we've, as we've been going along. And it seems to work well um, when we basically uh, rattle through some presentations, uh, which we'll do, uh, give you some updates and lots of things to think about, hopefully. Um, but what we'd love you to do is feel free to use the chat function. Uh, if you've got any comments or suggestions or things you want to share, please use the chat. Feel free to do that. And also, we're going to hopefully have about half an hour um, towards the end of the session for questions. Um, and because there's a lot of us, we're asking people to put their questions into the Q&A, which you should be able to find at the bottom of your screen, helpfully called Q&A. So if you've got a question uh, based on anything that you hear or that you want to ask about the test and trial or anything else that we talk about this evening, just if you could pop it in there. Um, and there's also, I think, an upvoting button. So if you see somebody else's question and you think it's a good one, I think you should be able to vote that and it sort of moves up the list. Um, so please do use that freely. If we don't get to your question tonight or we're not able to address um, it completely, it is really useful for us afterwards. We found these webinars gr a great way of getting feedback uh, that then goes straight into the, you know, the thinking and the work that we're doing on the test and trial. So whether it's a question in the Q&A or just a comment or an issue you want to share, please do. Uh, and we find it really useful afterwards, even if we don't manage to cover everything tonight. So it'd be great if you could... Um, and if you want to introduce yourself, introduce yourself on there and see who else is here in the chat, that would be great too. Um, as I said, the session's been recorded. Uh, I don't think there's anything else to say. We'll be finished by nine. So we've got some presentations. We'll canter through those. Hopefully you'll find lots of things of their interest. And then we'll have about half an hour at the end, uh, at least hopefully for some discussion and, and for, your, for us to tackle some of your questions. Um, so in terms of uh, what we do now, if we could move on from that welcome slide, Julia, and pop my slides up first. I'm, I'm first up uh, and then I'm going to pass to Julia. That is great. Thank you. OK, so actually, before we do that, we'll have a quick poll before you share your screen again. And we can just find out a little bit from you who's here, if that's OK. Feel free to just uh, have a little vote on there and then we can, uh, it's not the best way. We can't, we, it would be great if we could hear, uh, see you all, wouldn't it? But this just gives us a little flavour, a quick introduction uh, in terms of who's here. So we've got a, over 50% of our audience, it looks like this evening, are farmers, which is great. And quite a few common secretaries and chairs. That's interesting. 
I think we've we've added that category which we didn't have before so that's great that um there's a bit more of an insight into that thank you I think that, that might be everyone who's going to participate so we um blend that now And there's your results. I'm going to stop sharing that. Is that can I do that, Susie's in the background? And we'll move on. Okay, so our first um, presentation that I'm going to just whiz through is just to give you an update on where we are, are with our test and trial, uh, which has been running since July 2020. Um, so what I'm really going to do is just share some of the sort of key things we've been working on since our last webinar, which was in June, um, and highlight some of the issues that we're tackling and some of the recommendations that we're starting to make. Um, and so basically what I'm gonna show you is um, what we reported back to DEFRA in our most recent interim report, which was in September, uh, end of August. So if you could move on to the next slide, please, before you do that. Oh, it's disappeared. I should tell you, this is a flavour of what we're going to be talking about tonight. So I'm going to give you an update on the test and trial. I'm going to talk a bit about costs of preparing for an, agree an agreement. That's one of the issues we've picked up in these last few weeks. And then we're going to have Julia talking about negotiating management. And we've got Mike talking about capital works. We're going to be looking a bit at governance and how to address breaches. And then um, at the end, we'll hopefully have plenty of time for questions. So we'll crack on. Keep going, please, Julia. So just a reminder of what our test and trial is all about. Basically, we're producing, we're working with commoners to four commons at the moment, which have nearly sort of wrapped up. Uh, one on Dartmoor, one in the North York Moors, one in Cumbria and one in Gloucestershire. And we've been working closely with them to have a go at developing a sort of model for how you might um, come up with a new ELM agreement on commons. Uh, so as part of that, we've been looking at developing maps, baseline maps of public goods. So lots of discussion around public goods, how to identify and assess them on the common. What we might want the common to look like in 10 years time as part of that. And then uh, developing a management plan uh, with actions in it for what we do to get from A to B. And underpinning all that, we're working on a commons toolkit, which is sort of stacked with advice, templates, tips, um, on what you might need to do to get ready for ELM. So some of that we'll be talking about tonight as well. So that's just a quick, I've showed this before. So if you've been to one of these um, webinars before, I won't dwell on this, but that's just an overview of what we've been doing. Thanks. So if you can move to the next one, Julia, that's fine. Okay, so in terms of the sort of issues that we've been highlighting in the last few weeks, one of the things we've sort of really picked up on is the cost of, um, what a common would need to do to prepare uh, to start thinking about a new agreement. And there's a whole bunch of steps, I'm not gonna read them all out, but a bunch of questions there that a common would be asked, you'd be asking yourself uh, in terms of what you would need to do to get ready for a, an, an agreement right from the beginning, you know, who's gonna be involved, who do you need to speak to, what do they bring to the party through to right at the end when you've got your management plan and you're starting to think about what you're going to deliver through your new agreement, who's going to do what and who's going to get paid for that and how are you going to divvy that up with a whole bunch of other things uh, to do as you're going along. And one of the things that we've sort of really started to highlight and we're trying to put some figures on this at the moment is how much that, obviously it's the set, very different for different commons, but the range of costs that you could expect to have to invest to get ready and have a good go at putting together a new agreement. So that's one of the issues we've been highlighting and we'll talk a little bit more about that, especially around the um, mapping and survey work and what that might cost. So if you move on to the next one, Julia, please. Oh, there's the issues, how much does it cost? Who's gonna pay for it? So then the next uh, issue that we've been doing quite a lot of work on and sort of highlighting through our reports is this whole issue around identifying and assessing the condition of public goods. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit more shortly about ecological surveys and how you might do those. Could you just pop up the, the next one? There's a little box that's to pop up there, I think, Julia. Okay, so we've been doing some really good work, I think, with um, 
on our four commons, thinking about where the gaps are in knowledge about what the public goods are on the common and the condition they're in. Uh, lots of questions around who does the assessment of the public goods and who decides what's, what condition they're in and, and, and what needs to be done. Um, whether it's historic environment, public access, whether it's about habitats, visitor engagement. Um, how do you decide what the most important things are on the common in terms of public goods? And how do you work out what you don't know? And then what do you do to assess the condition of those public goods? And also the other big question, what's the standard? You know, what, what, would, be, what would be a good enough assessment and who would do it? Uh, so there's lots of questions around that that we're tackling at the moment. If you could move on to the next one, Julia. Okay, this is a biggie. And this is this when we first wrote the proposal and, and started work on, um, on the test and trial, we just said, yeah, yeah, we'll just produce a map of the public goods, uh, which sounds really quite straightforward, but of course it isn't. So we've been doing quite a lot of work in these past couple of months around trying out different methods of mapping. Um, so from using hard copies of ordnance survey maps printed off and drawing on them to having a go with the land app. Uh, we've been doing that on a couple of our commons. And then more recently we've tried, I never know whether it's QGIS or QGIS, but last week a few of us did some training on that and, and looked at how we might use that to uh, map the public goods on the common. Um, so there's lots of work going on around what tools to use. Again, who does that mapping? What should the standard of it be? What skills do you need to be able to do that? Um, is there stuff that you can do yourself on your common or are you going to need to get somebody else to do it and pay them to do it? So there's a, we, we've been doing quite a lot of work around that in these last few weeks and we've not cracked it, but um, we're also trying to put together quite a bit of advice on how you might approach that on your common. So that's another biggie. Then the next one, please, Julia. Okay, so this is obviously comes up all the time in terms of how we manage the relationships and power dynamics on the common. And I thought I'd just use the example of um, the common management plan that we've been working on and developing as part of the test and trial. Um, so this kind of highlights, especially that last, last column in that um, little table, this is our sort of draft management plan we've been having a go at filling in with our different commons. Um, but you know, who is responsible for doing these different bits of work on management actions on the common and, and then who would get paid for them and who decides what the most important actions are and how to divvy that up uh, across your common. So that just kind of highlights, you know, there's lots of different people coming uh, to the party with lots of different opinions on that and working out what's most important for the common, who's going to deliver it, who's going to get paid, just kind of um, illustrates, I think, you know, how we're constantly brokering these relationships and addressing the different power dynamics on the common. Um, so those issues there are sort of very live and we're trying to work our way through those and having a facilitator to help do that, we've found uh, seems to be quite a good suggestion. I think I've got another one, um, Julia, next, please. Okay, so the other work that's going on, as I mentioned at the beginning, if you just keep clicking, Julia, there's a couple of, couple more bits to this one, I think, is the... Um, is the Commons Toolkit, the Common Land Toolkit. So this is something that we're developing, which is gonna be an online resource with a whole bunch of advice, templates, checklists, bits of guidance, hopefully some bits of video when we've worked out how to upload them, which will um, bring to life a lot of the stuff that we, we've been talking about in terms of giving you practical tips on how to get ready for an agreement and how to manage your common. So if you just go on to the next one, Julia, this is my last one on this bit. Um, so what we're going to be doing next, we've got two more commons that we're going to work with uh, to test out some of this stuff that we've been developing. And then that toolkit, that online toolkit, we've got a few um, willing volunteers who've come forward and said they'll have a go at testing some of that out for us, trialing it out for us, seeing how it works. So we're giving them a bit, they're just going to be a bit of a DIY thing, really. We're just going to send them the link to the toolkit um, with a bit, with a bit of an overview, the kind of questions and things we'd like them to look at. And then they'll be giving us um, feedback and suggestions for improvements, which I'm sure there'll be plenty of. Um, but it's one of those things, isn't it? As soon as you start trying out this stuff and using it yourself, you straight away realise there's lots of things you want to improve. So um, I think our, sort of, our general sort of um, way we've approached is this is 
let's get something out there. We know it won't be perfect, but at least if it's practical and we can use it, what we want to do is really learn from people and get people to um, try things out for us. So in terms of timing, that's what we're going to be doing really in the next couple of months, working with a couple more commons using the toolkit to try and improve these, these things that we've been developing, getting more feedback. And then um, our test and trial officially finishes at, at, at the end of the financial year, March 22. So um, look out for uh, another webinar, probably at the end of December, and then a bit more work and some workshops, final reports, and hopefully more tweaking of the toolkit uh, in the early part of the new year. So that's a quick update on the test and trial. That's where we're up to. Thanks for that. I'm wondering, I think we'll keep going. Um, so we were hoping that we would uh, have um, another guest with us this evening, which was gonna be David Morley, who also works at H&H. &H, and he's been helping us with some of the survey work, some of the habitat surveys, um, but he's on holiday. So he's got away with not, um, not joining us this evening. So I've just got a few slides that I wanted to just share with you um, that David put together specifically around this issue around um, assessing the public goods uh, and doing survey work and what that might cost because that's something we've been sort of focusing in on so some of the um okay these are these are some of the costs that david has highlighted uh through his work there you go thanks i'm going to particularly talk about the first one quite a bit but these are some of the steps um, the main steps that David has highlighted at, from his experience as, as also working as a land agent and doing um, a lot of ecological survey work as well. Um, so these, I'll, I'll let you read those, I don't need to read them out. Um, and we'll be talking about a few of these this evening, but I just wanted to just highlight the first one because this is something we've been doing through the test and trial um, to have a look at uh, ecological surveys. So a couple of the commons that we've worked with we were talking, I was saying earlier about gaps in information. And this was one um, in terms of understanding the habitats on the common was something that was picked up by a couple of our commons and they asked for help with. So we've been having a look at this with them and David's been helping us. So David just sort of highlighted a few points which I'll share with you. Obviously the first one being that surveying on moorland is difficult. Um, that habitats don't always meet textbook conditions and that the criteria for assessment changes um, through the year. We talked about the fact that some habitats, rocky habitats or fragmented heath is picked out are especially difficult to map and draw accurate boundaries on. So obviously this all makes a difference to the cost of, of getting a survey done or getting some help with a survey. Um, you sort of picked out the fact that the bigger your common um, obviously, it's going to cost more, but the cost per hectare tends to go down as the common gets uh, bigger. Um, if you live, if you if your common is a very steep up and down terrain type common, then it's likely to take longer. Obviously, going up and down steep slopes and getting around on the common, and obviously accessibility um, is another thing. So, if you've got a lot of access points and you're near to a road, that's obviously going to be a lot quicker to survey than having to walk in uh, a long way which will add to the cost when you're getting a survey done. Um, it's to, it, he mentioned the fact in, in his feedback that um, priori priority habitats, so bogs, myers and heathland, tend to take longer to survey in the field and longer to map. So that's something else you might be thinking about uh, if you're thinking of getting a survey done. And obviously where there's a lot of habitats in a real sort of complex, more of a mosaic, that will take longer um, in the field and it'll take longer to map as well. So one of the things, that if, if David had been here, I think he would have said that um, the better information that you've got, the more useful that is to inform the, the future management of the common. Uh, no survey is perfect and basically you get what you pay for. Um, so his estimate is that the experience of H&H &H is probably, it's going to cost you between £2.50 and £3.50 a hectare to get a decent sort of baseline survey done of the habitats on the common. If you could move on to the next one, please, Julia. Okay, so these were just a couple of examples of the work that he's been doing for us. So you can see the one on the uh, left is, you know, really quite um, an interesting mosaic of habitats, which obviously took him quite a bit longer 
um, to do than the one on the right. Uh, so that's what he's been helping us to produce for the commons that we've been working with. So next one, please. So just this is just a final slide from baseline uh, from baseline from David. Uh, so just to say, obviously, David's worked on um, the habitat mapping for us, but there's a whole other bunch of public goods uh, that we'd want to try and get some baseline information for. So again, this is where the cost comes in. You know, there might already be data that exists on some of this stuff, whether you've got access to it or not, or are able to access it is another issue we've, we've raised in the past. But information around birds and animals, the historic environment, flood prevention, public access. Um, and importantly, people have raised this around the cultural heritage and the her cultural heritage of commoning and the landscapes too. You know, so all those things carry a value from a public good point of view. And we want to um, make sure that they're included, you know, in a new agreement. But we, it's all about finding good ways of identifying them and assessing their condition. So again, the cost is attached to that. So that was David's uh, update. I'm looking at my watch, we're okay, keep moving. Um, should we just pop up another poll and then I'm gonna pass over to you, Julia. This is just a little bit of info for us just out of interest. Uh, while Julia's getting her slides ready. Thanks everybody for your questions that are already coming in. I'm having a look at those, that's great. We'll just give it another few seconds for the poll. That's interesting. Plenty of people in high level stewardship are an in an extension. We'll leave that there for now and I'll pass over to Julia. And I'll go on mute. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. Lovely to be here. Thanks, Joe, for chairing everything so well. And it's really good to have so many people. We've been quite sort of amazed. Um, what we thought was a fairly niche topic has been so popular. Uh, so I'm um, really good to uh, um, have everybody with us today. Um, I'm just getting my what particularly I'm talking about today is we're, we're doing a you know, big emphasis today on commons governance and I'm going to talk about look, what, why does it matter and, and how we do the negotiations. And then Viv will do, um, after Mike's talk on Capital Works, Viv will do a bit about the actual managing the agreement when it's up and running. So I'm focusing on getting into a scheme. And why are we doing this? We're doing this because we would like effective management of livestock and the vegetation on the commons and all the other public goods we would, we would like successful entry into schemes. So good commons governance is critical and essential for going into schemes. We'd like a fair division of rights and responsibilities um, between what the contribution people are making and um, the, the amount of um, uh, the benefits they're getting from the scheme. And then dispute resolution is really important. And all of this is really about having enhanced business viability and delivering better outcomes for all. The, all farmers I know are, are very um, aware of their responsibilities, their stewardship role, in, I'm using the broader sense, um, and the number of people where commons are, 82% of commons are within national parks and protected areas, and therefore they're, they're much loved by the public. So just to quickly recap in terms of why you need a good commons governance is that at the moment, a lot of commons, a high proportion of commons are already in schemes. And as you'll be aware, while your BPS is paid directly to your bank account, and the HLS and um, CS come via the association. And next year, there'll be the new scheme, the Sustainable Farming Incentive 2022, which will be available on moorland and rough grazing. And we're in negotiations with DEFRA to encourage them to pay it on lowland um, common, so below the moorland line as well. So that money will come to the association as well. So if you don't have an association, it's gonna be really hard to access these funds. 
from 2025 onwards. Um, I hope by now you're all aware that basic payment is, will be halved by 2024. That will still come um, up until 2027, but it will be delinked, but that will still come directly to your business bank account. The rest of um, year-end schemes for the Commons will be paid um, via the association. So in terms of Commons governance, there are really three aspects to this. And it's just to remind you that you have the stewardship scheme at the bottom. You can see we've got the stewardship scheme and the parties to that are the association. And then the chairman um, usually signs and you can have one signatory, the chairman is authorized by the association. In some cases, there's an administrator. And so that may be the association chairman or the administrator, and then they're signing up with DEFRA and Rural Payments, the RPA, um, manage the schemes, deliver the schemes on behalf of DEFRA. We then um, need to have, in terms of the payment service, all the beneficiaries, so everyone who's receiving money from the scheme has to be registered on the Rural Payments Service. So everyone has the rights to you know, ring up the RPA, ask about the scheme, um, but they should all have their their um, their own SBI will be linked to the agreement. That also means if something goes wrong, it's an opportunity for um, for RPA to consider um, whether they're going to be how they're going to be um, asking for money back again. And then the foundation for both these agreements is the internal agreement, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. And that every beneficiary of the scheme needs to sign up, uh, and the association chairs. And ask, they will sign, the association officers will sign on behalf of, um, of the association. So that's an agreement between the association and every beneficiary. And this should be signed as a deed. Um, it's really important it's signed as a deed because it's um, much more enforceable. And this is one challenge, big challenge of Commons is how do we enforce this? How do we make sure collectively that is um, working, working well? Hopefully it stays in the bottom drawer for much of the, um, the agreement period, but when you do need it, you certainly need it. So the internal agreement covers who will, who is involved in the agreement, um, and maybe it will, it will also cover whether new parties can come in if a farm is sold, or if some rights that um, weren't being used suddenly become used again, you need the ability to bring in new members. It will cover who will be doing what, so who will be turning out what sheep, cattle and ponies, um, who will be doing works, for instance, on bracken, on tree planting, on peat restoration, and when they'll be doing it. So there's likely to be a stocking calendar involved as well. This is all detailed in the internal agreement because the agreement with the Rural Payments Agency will just give a total for the number of sheep, cattle, ponies. Um, it won't say who is doing what and who has how many sheep. So the internal agreement is absolutely core. Cool. It will also say, who's going to, to receive how much. So what money will you be paid for the obligations? And it's very much, this is public money for public goods. And that if people are providing uh, benefits to society as a whole, then they ought to be being paid for that in the same way you're paid for your livestock in the ring or however you choose to sell your livestock, you will also be being um, paid for the public goods you're providing. And the reason doing this is because we're delivering outcomes. So not being paid, to maintain a stocking number, as in the stocking calendar. The stocking calendar is there, is the effective prescription, but what you're actually being paid for is delivering the outcome. And it's really important to remember, it is the outcomes that the, the RPA, DEFRA are paying for. So, um, so as I said, the internal agreement is the backstop for when, when the wheel falls off, when things go wrong. It's really important to use a lawyer, land agents, accountants, your friend down the road, uh, the retired vicar, whoever it is who's helping you out, is not legally entire, um, entitled to, um, to um, pay to, to draft a deed. So it's really critical. Um, now, this meant to be something really clever that worked here, but it doesn't like that hyperlink is saying that's not good. Anyway, it's this was really about um, a, a bit of information about the, the steps. I might take I will we will now move on we haven't got a lot of time anyway um, so these these um, documents will be available on the toolkit so in terms of um, splitting the funds what we really say is that what's really critical is that how you draft the principles for splitting the funds what I always advise people to do is not to um, actually say Fred's getting 10 pence and Joe's getting 20 pence is to draft the principles about how you're going to split the money up 
Are you paying per sheep that's put on the common? Are you paying per sheep that's got, coming off the common? How are you splitting the money between different types of livestock? And that's really critical. Get the principles agreed first. But what's really key is that you don't give people two options. Shall we pay everyone £10 or shall we pay them £20? Because generally turkeys don't vote for Christmas. So you must make sure that you just have one set of principles and you iterate that. If it doesn't work, consider how you can do it again, because the last thing you want to do is split your Commons Association in two. And as soon as you give people options about shall we do A or B, you almost inevitably, there are winners and losers from both and you split your group. The other really important thing is to clarify the rights. So it's ex to explain, to, to make sure how many common rights has each person got. What we often find is people have some rights to do with, um, they may own some land, they may rent some land, they may have an informal arrangement, whiskey may be given on New Year's Day for the rights, whatever it is, you need to know the details. And we, in our toolkit, we've got a form that you can use to collect that information. But key is maintaining transparency about all this information. It's not about the personal information of people's um, you know, own farm businesses, but we do need transparency over who's got which rights, how much people are going to be paid. And that needs to happen throughout the life of the agreement. This is public money that's being spent and it has to be linked to people's delivery and rights to receive that money. So linking payments to activity rather than inactivity is something I'm really keen on. Um, so that will be different sorts of things that people can do. And some people may be involved in shepherding, other people may be involved in grazing cattle or ponies at certain times of the year, other people are grazing sheep, but link it to activity. The other thing in terms of, of the funds is always keep a contingency. You know, we reckon about five thousand pounds. These are the as Viv will so like these are large, you know, their, their turnovers for a lot of commons agreements are very high. So the steps to getting an agreement, I'd say first, you need to establish trust between people. When, when people ring me up and say, Judo, can you help us with your, your HLS agreement or CS agreement? And don't worry, we all get on. It's absolutely fine. I'm genuinely, I, I'm never, it's very rare for that to be case because people might get on when they go gathering. But as soon as you start talking about money, it's really important that um, we, particularly between the facilitator and each corner, that there is trust. People can trust you with confidential information they give you as well as information that needs to be shared. And what we're talking about is a collective of individual businesses. So really important that whoever's doing the facilitation understands the individual's perspective and spends time with each person. I would generally say you need to visit every person in their house, their own house. A village hall is fine for megaphone diplomacy, but it's not, doesn't help you deliver uh, the, the nuances of an agreement. You need to be flexible in your negotiations. As I said, maintain transparency and allow enough time. We generally say 12 to 18 months for a brand new agreement. Even for negotiating a rollover, you probably need um, that sort of time, but certainly six to nine months is a minimum. There's lots to think about. But in the end, there is a degree of tough love involved in this. And not everyone can have their way. I trained our under a brilliant land agent called Alan Bow, and he said, if everyone's a little bit unhappy, we probably got it about right because you know, there comes a point where you have to say, are you signing or are you not? Um, and those, Mike's going to cover the capital works. So I think that's um, uh, most of what I wanted to cover. Is that all right, Joe, in terms of time? That's fine, you've, you've, done, <laughs> you've done very well. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> We're through it, thanks, that's great. Okay, um, yeah, we'll keep going, so we'll, I hope everybody's okay. It's funny when we can't see you. Was I on mute then? There, I'm muted. Thank you. So yeah, we'll we'll keep going. Thanks everybody. Just keep your questions coming, and um, feel free to add things into the chat. That's great. Uh, so we'll move on to Mike now, if that's okay. Yeah. Just get his slides up. Um, there we go. Mike. Hi, good evening. Um, very pleased indeed to have been uh, invited to present to you this evening. Um, Julia, could, could you just confirm you can see my uh, see my slides? Yes, yeah, they're looking great. Okay, jolly good. Um, so I've been asked to really talk to you about the actual delivery of the com of um, of capital works on commerce, but but of course we haven't delivered any capital works under Elms, and so I don't really have. Elm's experience to share, share with you, but I've been working on common land delivering 
um, capital work projects for ooh, 10 years or so. Um, so I wanted just to share some of that experience with you. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of stages. Um, we've got uh, pre-application stages, things we've got to consider during the application. And then the actual delivery period, which is after the application's gone in and we've got a live agreement. This is the actual jumping in, boots on ground, um, getting the work done. And then we've got enduring management. So what I mean by that is um, sort of the ongoing management. So after the initial delivery stage, we're going to have to look after the project that we've delivered. So, um, so this is uh, certainly enduring management to look after. So pre-application. And this, this normally starts with just some ideas. Um, you know, we've got this big lump of land what are we going to do with it under our under our next scheme and i think i think this really sort of ties very nicely into what joe was talking about with the um with the commons management plan it's very much the projects that you're going to be delivering are very much linked to the landscape the topography priority habitats and species but of course you might also be building upon work you've already delivered maybe through um through hls or um, a cs agreement and actually from, from those previous agreements, you're gonna know what has worked and what hasn't really gone very well. And so that will really guide you, I think, into, um, into where you go next. And then of course, each one of the stakeholders will have their own priorities. Um, the owners might well be you know, very much involved. You might be talking about an active grouse moor, um, of course, the graziers' priorities, um, other rights holders, and then of course we've got Natural England, Historic England, and other um, sort of you know, government body type stakeholders um, who will all have a view on, on 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 what should be delivered on the common. So some example projects there that I've been involved in. Um, most recently I've been on with some um, uh, peatland restoration projects that included thousands of um, grip blocks going onto, uh, onto all the old grips, uh, bare peat restoration, hag reprofiling. And then I've got a few different types of tree planting, whether that's uh, riparian planting just to uh, protect um you know, steep gullies and what have you or whether it's wood pasture scrub planting juniper planting interestingly i've also been involved in um in a i'll, I'll be coming on to some photos of it in a minute but uh, but actually some 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 um some scrub clearance projects this is where um inappropriate tree species have been spreading onto this piece of um triple si common land and um and actually through the capital works we've We've delivered a clearance program. Um, historic features, of course, um, are uh, yeah quite prevalent up on common ground, and uh, there might be some restoration or at least some making safe to do of uh, of some historic features, and then uh, yeah gorse cutting and bracken control. So. Um, Here's, here's a big lump of moorland. Uh, this is actually um, up in North Yorkshire. And, and as you can see here, you know, this is an active grouse moor. And you can see this crisscross pattern of all these uh, grips which have been draining that, um, draining that, that, that common for grazing and, um, and, and grouse purposes. Now, under the HLS, they actually delivered a whole bunch of grip blocks. I'm not sure how well you can see that, but that's sort of a zoomed in view. And you can see these black lines are our, are our grips. Then each one of these are individual blocks that have been put in under HLS. Now, some of them done a fantastic job, um, but some of them are failing or, um, or perhaps weren't delivered very well, or maybe it was all in a bit of a rush. But but as part of um, you know new agreements, we can look at that and think, well, you know that previous project has partially worked. Here's our opportunity to jump in and and uh, and, and and improve the the, um, the outcome. So this is a uh, uh, Joe also talked about um, uh, good quality mapping, and this is really important for 
those early pre-application stages when you're building this uh, commons management plan is to identify where these grips are. These different colors on here are representing different depth and different width of grips. And uh, really th this, the quality of this data is so important because this can form our specification for um, for contractors when we actually put the put the work out to tender we want some high quality data that can actually be tendered against and then of course our outcomes our, our, our deliverables if you like can then be measured against this this um, baseline information um, so some more pretty pictures I have thousands of pictures of um, of Pete on my hard drive so uh, hag edge um, to uh, to sort of you know, reprofile. We've got some bare peat where actually that just wants that water slowing down to stop this uh, this gullying effect and that sediment from running off. This is the um, this is a piece of triple SI land above a, a forest commission um, plantation woodland below, and this is that um, that tree removal job. And of course, unfortunately, that photo doesn't quite do it justice. It's seriously steep ground. So um, uh, yeah, there's another project getting some contracts in there, of, um, uh, clearing saws and what have you to uh, to drop these trees. There's some more of the the trees in there, some of the even steeper gullies. This is a this is a planting project. Um, this is in Central Lakes, and this is um, a, you might just be able to make out on that sort of far back right hand corner um, a big block of woodland down there. So what's happening here is we're really been sort of bringing that habitat up and onto the fell and it's actually got a bit of resource protection there there's a there's a bit of a beck in the bottom of there as well there's some more of the same tree planting project and uh yeah soil stabilization planting trees to stabilize this soil in order to stop it from this is actually in the headwaters of the river eden of course river eden is a uh, a massive linear triple si and so uh this project was all about reducing that sediment from getting down into there. Um, and again, steep sided gullies, uh, planting in order to sort of protect that soil. This is a slightly different project. This was where instead of just um, putting some stock fences up and putting some short trees in, this is where we've um, experimented with uh, different types of tree protection. So here, obviously, we're looking at weld mesh cages to to keep livestock off the trees. Um, and again, it's uh, riparian planting. Uh, same spot, different angle. But actually, the, the beauty of this is we're not losing grazing land necessarily. Um, so, uh, so, you know, sheep are still free to, 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 to come down and graze, graze through all of this area. But of course, it's not just environmental works, it's also landscape works. Um, so here we've got uh, an example of um, some stone wall restoration in order to, um, you know, stone walls, of course, are really important in, uh, in, in, in landscape character. And this is restoration of some, um, some stone walls. And again, and then of course, yep, historic features up on the fells. Um, you know, we've, uh, we could easily use scheme monies to consolidate some of these things, if, if not necessary to restore them, certainly to make them safe. So pre-application, obviously we need to talk to all, all, all of the stakeholders and, and we, need, we need ideas. Uh, we, need, we need everyone to be involved to, to sort, of, sort of table all the ideas for the, for the common. And, and, that, and that needs to include Natural England, needs to involve, you know, in, when, when, when we're talking about historic features like that, obviously we need to get um, Historic England and, uh, and you know, the, the, uh, the local authority historic environment team on board with any such project. Now under CS, obviously we, 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 uh, we did feasibility studies, but um, yeah, if, if, if this is going into a, a more of a management plan approach, it's really important that, that management plan needs to not only pick up the, the, the what we want to do, but very much how we're going to do it. And then of course it needs to think about um, other things which um which you know on the face of it you might not consider so if we're planting trees that's all well and good but have we actually assessed the deer pressure 
And, and, and what are we going to do about that deer pressure when, as commoners, we don't necessarily have the sporting rights to control deer? Are, are, how are we going to manage that problem? So that, all of that needs to go into that feasibility study or management plan. And then, of course, once we've got that study, we very much need to review it. And, and everyone around the table needs to, needs to review that because if, if this is becoming our brief for contractors, we need to make sure that if, um, if, the, if the graziers want a particular type of mesh on, on any fences in order to stop lambs' heads from getting caught, we need to make sure that's specified at this stage. And then, of course, we move on to the application stage itself. And this is where we need our you know, detailed and comparative quotes and, and, and again, this, this really pushes, um, pushes that importance of having a good quality management plan and feasibility study, because that can, that, that can actually be our tender specification as well um, for, our, for our contractors to quote against. Um, and then, of course, there's lots of other things in there, environmental impact assessments, historic impact, um, his, uh, landscape impact assessments. And then, of course, there's consents as well. So we would need consents from the local authority uh, regarding drainage. So uh, ironically, blocking up drainage requires drainage consent from a local authority. Um, then if there's works on a river, we might need to talk to the um, EA. Um, historic consents if we're, if we're working around scheduled ancient monuments or anything like that. And then, of course, the big E for commons in particular is, uh, yes, yeah, Secretary of State consents. So a lot of the projects I've been working on of late haven't required this because we've been looking at um, sort of more open planting without fences or we've been looking at um, peat restoration. But as soon as we're talking about putting up fences um, and you know, impeding or preventing access to common land, we very much need Secretary of State consent. Now I could do a presentation for half an hour just on Secretary of State consent, so I'm, I'm actually going to park it there. Um, so financing works. Now, the grants are usually paid after the works have been delivered, so that was certainly the case under HLS and CS. Um, and that means that the association needs some cash at hand to actually bankroll the delivery of the works. And for smaller projects, that's not such a big deal, because actually if you've got 10 association members if each of them puts a thousand pound in a pot you've got you've got a nice bit of working working capital um to go ahead deliver some works and then claim it back from the rpa and then repay the loans from association members now that's all well and good but what happens if we're talking you know 40 50 60 thousand pounds well there i think we'll be looking at holding back some you know maybe your your year 10 funds from your hls hold some of that back and that and that way the association has some uh working capital to go forward into into the delivery phase of the new scheme and mike, then just, sorry to interrupt mike we're just we're just just watching time could you just sort of whiz through your your, your, your oh. last couple of slides <laughs> okay yeah sure sure Thank you. okay um and, uh partnerships that's a real a real key one um yeah i think i think there's there's loads of mileage there to talk to national park authorities the wildlife trust woodland trust etc um and and get them on board and, and get some working capital um in place um, and then, of course, we're actually delivering the works next. Um, so this is where I think actually with a bigger project, you need a project manager. Um, it can be quite a burden for uh, an unpaid member of the association to, uh, to, to, to deliver this and get it right. And there's lots of people to go to to do that, whether it's your, your actual tree planting contractor, he could act as a project manager if you didn't think there's too much of a conflict there. Um, but uh, agents, uh, maybe the landowner might want to take that on. Um, or indeed a partnership organisation. And of course, you've only got two years under, under CS anyway, you've only got two years to actually deliver the capital work. So actually that timetabling, uh, uh, sequencing of works, dead important. Um, I think this is my second to last slide. Um, the, uh, I think I just want to pick up on contingency um, as the main point from that slide. Here, we really need to make sure that there's some um, some money in the pot in order to cope with uh, uh, 
unforeseen circumstances for example this this year uh, most of you will know what, what what's happened with the with the cost of timber and so um, when you when when you're putting up 20,000 meters of um of 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 fencing that's a lot of posts and so even a few pence rise on 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 your fence posts is going to have a significant uh bump you know um a knock on effect um and that's particularly um difficult when you're being paid at a standard rate for your fencing um oh, enduring management so yeah main main one on this slide is simply that maintenance payments are very much for the maintenance and when your trees get flattened from wind or snow or or landslip or being eaten by deer you know, there's a there's a real strong uh, requirement there to actually spend that maintenance money to uh, to you know keep the uh, keep the scheme right i just want to share a couple of photos just to finish off this is uh, you can barely see the grip on here but there's a vegetated grip there and it acts as a bit of a a bit of a pipe carrying water off the um, off, off the moorland here. So this is just a peat plug that's gone into there. This uh, peat plug's actually doing their job and actually holding back some of that water. Uh, more peat plugging, more peat. Uh, this is the coir rolls in order to stop the um, erosion of this peat hag. Coir rolls. Um, and yeah, more tree planting. Uh, I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> so Joe, I'm going to hand it back to you. Thank you. I can tell you like taking pictures of peat. I'm sure you've got a very interesting photo gallery. On peat and on trees. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. That's great. So hopefully that's given people a bit of um, a few things to think about in terms of obviously we're doing this work on uh, developing a common management plan through the test and trial. Uh, and these are the kind of things that we hope will end up in the toolkit. So some of the advice that um, some of the advice that Mike uh, suggested there in terms of his experience and they're the sort of things that we're building into the toolkit uh, working on what we know from the past but also thinking about how we might adapt that for for elms so do keep your questions coming I think Julie might be typing a few answers I'm going to pass to Viv now who has got we've got this one more presentation from Viv and then we'll get stuck into some chat so thanks for your patience everybody keep asking those questions and uh, feel free to comment in the chat I'll pass to you now Viv Hello, everybody. Um, I'm right, I've just got to start my video. Sorry. Um, hello, everybody. And it, it's really good to be here. I found Mike's slides really, really interesting. And I love the enthusiasm. I mean, everybody, both Joe, Mike and Julia have set up my presentation really well. So what I'm looking at now or what we're looking at is how do we keep the, the scheme running smoothly and it delivers for all? That's the basis of good governance. Can you pass um, on the next slide, please, Julia? Okay, again, Julia has talked about this. It's about getting the right tools. The paperwork matters, but it's complicated and it has to be right. Um, Julia mentioned the stewardship scheme and the internal agreement and what needs to go into it. One of the issues that I found is don't assume that all parties have a good grasp of the paperwork. Many commoners um, understand their, their countryside stewardship schemes and their own home farms on their in by land. But because this is like a collective scheme, often people have a slightly arm's length understanding of the scheme. And it's important that whoever is working on it and delivering it and the, and the people who are governing it actually understand the scheme. So first of all, we need the right tools, which Julia's talked about. Can we move on, please? And then we want the right people. Many common schemes have large turnovers. These are, you know, like over £100,000 a year, £200,000 a year. Over 10 years, we're talking about 1 million to 2, 2 million, 3 million projects. These, I think we have to look at as SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises. They are not small voluntary organisations run by volunteers. Therefore, it is really important, and I'm talking about big schemes here, pay the right professionals to support the chair and the committee. Mike talked about project management for capital works. That could actually um, you know, reduce a huge headache for the, the chair and the committee. I think again, you know, often you really could do, I mean, a lot of these schemes could do with an independent administrator or secretary, independent um, treasurer or accountancy firm or land agent. And this costs money. There's SP10 money for the duration of the scheme. And if we've got any natural England colleagues here, I would like to sort of ask you, I mean, um, 
to recognize that actually running a project, because this is a big project, costs money. You know, I've heard of SP10 only for the first two years of the scheme and then it gets taken away. If you're an NGO running a million pound project, you would be having a paid employee to do that. We need this money. If you want a, a well-run scheme, there has to be money to pay the right people to do it. Can we move on, please? And also getting the right management committee. Because what we're having, I mean, even if you're employing people to run the scheme, the scheme is um, delivered by the commoners and the commoners association. That association has to work. It has to know how to oversee the people that you're employing or maybe not employing, but they're self-employed. You know, they're, they're self so whoever's on the committee needs to understand the scheme and rules. They need to act as a team. They need to put the interests of the scheme first. Now, this is quite interesting because on most committees, you have to declare contra, um, conflicts of interest. So, uh, you know, in this case, just about everybody who will be on the committee, the management committee, has a conflict of interest because they're a beneficiary of the scheme. So this is taken um, for granted. So it's it's also when you are on the management committee, you need to think, you know, think, be fair to other people. Try and put yourself in other people's shoes. Um, and who should be on the committee as well as graziers as well, um, and potentially non-graziers there's other stakeholder interests like the owners um, should be invited on the committee and should be there on the committee um, you need to be honest and make sure that people know what's going on we've talked about transparency and accountability that is really important what I've seen quite often in commons is you get little cliques of people who you know think they know more and they, they start, start start rumors and that actually makes it really difficult to run we've talked about make sure the ski money is spent according to the rules um, and another thing that's really important is try to stop things going wrong early often people will come to the chairman or they'll come to the secretary and say did you know that so and so is doing x or y um, and you know, maybe a quiet word very early on can nip it in the bud before it becomes a problem and a, and, and a dispute and deal with breaches and complaints in a fair way. Um, and then again, that's about having clear rules and procedures. Can we move on? And so here we are, is getting the good practice. I mean, this is just another summary. I've talked about these stuff. We need transparency. Julia's talked about transparency. We need bank account manage, management to make sure that whoever the signatories to the checks are not related to each other. Usually it's good to have, I mean, you must have at least two people assigning checks, but maybe it needs to have three signatories in case someone's away. In terms of expenditure, often um, you know, the committee might have powers to, you know, to spend money up to save, 500 pounds before it has to go to the whole all the members if the committee is working well they might you know they might at the agm say look we're thinking about spending 500 five thousand pounds this year we need to renew this fence we need to do some maintenance so that decision's already made and they don't have to have a special meeting to then allow people to spend over whatever the powers that the committee have minuted meetings are really important and to send out the minutes soon after the meeting. If, you're, if it's been run by a management committee, then the people, members won't be going to those meetings, but they want to know what's happened, what's being discussed. Clear rules and sanctions, we'll talk a bit about that. Firm but fair leadership. That's, you know, great. It's sad. All these things sound good in, in theory. In fact, they are good in theory, but they're often very hard in practice because when we're talking about commons associations, these are people that could be your uncles, brothers, sons, cousins, your neighbours who you've known for years, and also people that maybe you don't get on with very well. So it's quite hard. It's a very tricky role to play. And I've mentioned the use of independent specialists. Carry on, please. Try to, I'm, trying, I'm sorry if I'm talking a bit fast, but we're slightly running out of time. So what can go wrong? I mean, basically there's two areas where things can go wrong with the stewardship agreement, and that's with Natural England and RPA, and also with the internal agreement. It is about non-compliance with stocking calendars. Here's some examples. Um, uh, if you're not allowed to do supplementary feeding and someone's supplementary feeding, trespass into stock inclusion enclosures, um, in the internal agreements, non-compliance with uh, grazing rules, not taking part in collective action, not, you know, going on gathers, changing sheet marks, that can happen, breeze. There's lots of things that 
people can get up to. And sometimes it's quite astounding what they do. Can we move on? Okay, so we have rules, but how do we implement these rules? How do you put them to practice? Because the internal agreement you know, is full of rules and so is the stewardship agreement, but it doesn't actually say what to do. For example, and this is, you know, these are live examples. How do you actually implement your rules? We've got a commoner who's suspected of grazing more sheep cattle than allowed. It's, a, it's suspected. So you have to consider how do we find out? How do we actually know this is happening? What evidence do we need to gather to make a case? On one commoner, I know they suspected that some people were overgrazing and other undergrazing or not sticking to their stocking calendar. So they decided to have a count at each gather and got an inter, you know, they, got an independent counter to come in and count all the sheep at the shedder. That worked quite well, because it could see that how many people, how many sheep people were putting up. And there was obviously a tolerance, they weren't going for exact figures. And that worked fine. Uh, and they carried on doing that. But then a couple of years later, one of the people said, well, you know, Fred, two days before the gather, he takes a lot of sheep off. And then someone comes along and says, well, you know, John, two days before the gather, he puts sheep on so that his count is, you know, he's manipulating the count. Then what do you do about that? And that this is, these are, these are real live examples. And it's about, you know, and so I'm saying to people, well, what do you do? Do you sit at the, you know, sit at the Moreland gate or the commons gate two days before to watch what's going on? Do you then take photos? And then when I, you know, when you then go and talk to Grace as well, I don't really want to cause any bother. I don't want to you know, uh, take photos. What do I do? So sometimes, although it's easy to say gathering the evidence, sometimes it's actually quite hard to gather the evidence. And sometimes people, although they grumble, don't actually want to gather the evidence. So it's a, it's a really tricky situation. It's all about relationships and personalities. You could ask, is this a first occurrence? Do you ask them to put things right immediately? Would you impose a penalty? And this depends on whether it's potentially a breach of the scheme and isn't actually England going to impose a penalty. And what if they don't agree with you? And this is where we go into dispute resolution. Next slide, please. Okay, here's a basically, a, um, you know, this is a standard model for dispute resolution. There's lots of models. Talk, and we've talked around it, talk to all, all sides informally. This is, this is when you get an external, I mean, if you cannot you know, manage it within your Commons Association, you're, getting, you're going out to an external person to help you just be a resolve the, the dispute. And often in your internal agreement, it will say who you should be going to, and often it's a land agent um, or, or, um, from a, you know, nearby that people know who's, who's, you know, who's good at this, good at dispute re resolution. You collect the facts. Sometimes, as I mentioned, sometimes the facts are easy to collect. Often they aren't that easy. The main thing is to try to encourage everyone to see all sides. What's going on? Why are people doing that? Why has that person not put us up as many sheep as they said they would? Maybe, you know, thinking about it, maybe they had too many twins between sort of May and July and they actually didn't have the sheep to put up, but then they could put the right up, 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 number up later. You know, understand what's going on. Remind people what the agreement says. You can issue warnings and seek further mediation between the parties. And one thing, you can withhold part of the payment. Um, next slide, please. This is really your last one, Viv. This is my last slide, yes. Right, so thanks. Before your next agreement, review. I mean, it's, it's a bit like what Mike was saying. What has gone well and not so well? Look at your constitution. Is it fit for purpose? I've seen constitutions that might have been all right when they started. They started off with the ESA and then they went in high level stewardship and added other bits and then they've added other bits. And sometimes you find clause in the constitution that are actually contradicting each other. Go back and review it. Review the internal agreement. Yes, they're done by professionals. Yes, they, I mean, we had no lawyers looking at that, but we're, as Julia said, we're always learning. Did it work? What worked well? Was there anything actually missing from your internal agreement? Because every common's different. Does something go wrong? The grazing rules, these are the internal grazing rules, were they enforceable? And if not, scrap them. Again, I can give you an example. I know one grazing rule where you have to have a good working dog that, you know, when you're gathering the fowl. 
uh, then someone would complain, oh, so-and-so's dog, you know, it didn't work really well, it spent most of the time on, on the quad bike. That often happens. They call the Federation in to sort of see if we could do anything about it. But I could not get anybody who would want to adjudicate whether that was a good working dog or not. People were not prepared to do that. So if you can't enforce it, scrap the rule. And there's a lot of grazing rules that actually are very difficult to enforce. Look at, is it practical? Um, the professional help you got in, were they competent? Would you use them again? Would they like to work with you again? You know, how's the committee working? And the management committee, were they the right, pe right people? How did the meetings go? Were the meetings good? Were some people dominating the meetings? Um, were the meetings friendly and cordial? Or were they, they, people had arguments? Did some people talk and other people not? Interestingly, did the committee members stay the same for the duration of the scheme? Because often people will not volunteer. What do you do about that? You know, in some schemes you're having, you know, the management committee has to be re-elected every three years. There's deadly silence, no one puts their name forward. And the same with the chair, it often is, and it's a pretty difficult task. It seems to be, um, I've, see, I've seen lots of chairs get burnt out um, and don't want to do it again. How do we look after our chairs? How do we help other people come up, take, you know, come step forward and chair the Commons Association? It's a difficult task. Will they volunteer next time? And I think that's my last slide. Thank you, Viv. Thanks. So oh, that's yeah, that it looks like it. So that's who you've heard from that quick list. Um, hopefully, you've taken away from that um, lots of tips about maybe your current agreement, preparing for another agreement. A lot of this stuff we've been talking about is going to end up in our toolkit uh, as part of the work we're doing through the test and trial. Obviously, you know, based on the experience of people like Viv and Julia and the and the feedback that we're gathering. But hopefully you might want to watch some of these slides, you know, use them, look at them again, use this recording to think about what you can be doing to start thinking about your next agreement and new agreements. And I'm just going to pass to you, Julie, just to sort of emphasise that point and just a quick mention of SFI and then we'll have a look at the questions. Thank you very much. Um, and yeah, there are quite a few things because we've really probably tried to pack in too much this evening. And so I apologise. There are quite a few things that we haven't covered. Um, I want to just say a little bit about the policy development in terms of SFI, because uh, you may well have heard that the Sustainable Farming Incentive has started on, on Inside Land and as a pilot, and the closing date for the pilot is um, tomorrow. So if you were thinking of applying, that's the deadline. But it's not in supply to Commons yet. But from 2022, there will be SFI for moorland and rough grazing. This is going to be to um, effectively create um, a plan. So it's at the introductory level. SFI comes in three tiers, introductory, intermediate and advanced. And the, the tier that's been rolled out in 2022 is for, the, is for creating a plan. And the, this is, will really help fund a lot of the work we've been talking about today. We're not yet sure of all the details and we're working with DEFRA closely on that, but it hasn't been finalised yet. But it's really important that good quality data is collected. But you will need to consider as an association and work with the owner um, and the owner hopefully is a member of your association as well. And they're in, engaged with, with you at various different situations, how, um, how active an owner is in the management. But it's really important that we that you work together to find a way forward. And so in terms of the timing, we're hoping at the end of November, the, there will be more details on the SFI. Um, and uh, at that point, George Eustace has said in June that they would be announcing details of um, payment rates going up as well. So that will apply. The, the other key thing about the SFI 22 is that you can have this in addition to your HLS and countryside stewardship. So that's really important for SFI 22. So it will be an underpinning agreement, and that is to help the bridging going forward. So between 2022, 20, you'll probably apply in about March time, get the agreement in the autumn, and you don't have to do any actual works, but we're looking at things such as um, creating a plan for what capital works you might do. So the sort of things Mike has highlighted, consider what can be done. Um, where, that you will then be paid for in the future. Consider what grazing plan is required. Consider what vegetation management is required. If you've got an area where you've got you know, wildfire risk, that's something else that, that can be considered. How's that going to be managed? 
So we're going to be running uh, some sessions around the country, round in sort of between end of November and and January, February, um, and we'll be uh, actually going to areas where we've got a project called Our Common Cause, Our Upland Commons, and everybody will be welcome to come to those, and we may well do a webinar because I think there's going to be a there's a lot of learning. So one of the questions was, can you do these surveys yourself? And the answer is, it depends. If you are an ecologist and you understand what you're doing, great, of course you can do it yourself. But it's a bit like saying, can I you know, do the conveyancing for my house myself or can I write the internal agreement? As Viv has stressed, it's really important that you have appropriate people for the work. What is though important is that all the owners and the commoners are very involved in that process so that they understand what uh, Natural England and the Rural Payments Agency and DEFRA are looking for. And there's been quite a lot of questions around that. How do we balance these different public goods? And it's difficult. Some of them are complementary. You can stack them, you can deliver for nature and, and climate. On other ones, they may be conflicting and delivering for one makes it harder to deliver for the other. So I know we've got lots of questions coming in and we've only got 15 minutes. I've been trying to answer a few online. Joe, done, done well, yeah, so I mean, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll pick up the pick owner. The, sorry, the two that I, yeah. I thought were the, we want to cover the role of the owner, which because yeah. of time um, uh, was run out. And also um, a bit about the, a bit more on the financing of the actual, the cash rolling, the cash bank rolling of the, the capital works. If you're typing an answer on the first one around the position and role of the landowner, does that do you want? Do either of you want to say anything around that one? That's come Sorry. up. <laughs> I, yeah, I was just looking how to do it, but I don't think I'm. Let's right. do it live. Yeah. Shall, yeah. I say, shall I say a bit and you chip in? Yes. Um, yeah. So, so the owner is essential, and I apologise if people feel we haven't given. When we talk about the Commons mm. Association, we are assuming that the owner is part of the Commons Association. You may have active graziers inactive graziers, people who may want to start grazing and the owner, and they should be in fully engaged in the whole process. Clearly at the moment, you require owner's consent to go into a scheme um, and they sign off the supplementary form. Um, it's really important to, to, again, look at the individual perspective. So, the, and, and some, I know one, one common where Viv is the secretary, she's got, I think, five different owners and that's, um, it's really important. They will have different interests. So it may be a water company, it may be a private estate, it may be, um, a, it may be natural England, it, it may be um, you know, people with a range of different interests. So it's really important. It may be one of the commoners in some cases who, who owns the common. So that's absolutely key. They can also, in terms of the financing, I know Mike had this on his slide, but to stress that in some cases, the owners are absolutely brilliant at managing the capital works and bankrolling that. Um, but in other cases, you know, that they, the owner isn't able to do that because they may not have the cash available in order to do that. And then alternative, it's come in. But I don't know, Viv, whether you want to add anything more about the owner's role. No, not particularly. It's just what you said, Julia, is actually it's talking to the owners, getting them on board. And they actually, from my experience, owners are, have, are having more active interest in, in common schemes. And, you know, they have to be there. Yeah. I'll move on to the next question then because that's that's kind of owner related as well it's one from robin milton thanks and if quite a few people have upvoted your question robin uh it's around um it's quite long to read but i'm going to read it could commons elm agreements become sidelined or dependent on owners carbon credit ambitions and then it, that, that, that's the main question really if the approach implied in ireland is used by defra where paid activities that enhance carbon would negate the value of carbon credits as it may be considered dual funding. Oh, you've written a nice long question there, but the, the, the question's in that first bit, isn't it? Could Commons Elm agreements become sidelined or dependent yeah, on owners' carbon credit? Carbon, carbon credit? I think mm. what's really important is to think is how they get the carbon credits are for sequestering carbon, it's for delivering change. Nobody pays you for just doing what you're doing already. It's about, but because if you're, you know, you've got, you know, I was told, oh, well, you can get EasyJet to come and, you know, buy carbon credits on your land. Well, they're doing that because they're pushing out carbon the whole time and they need to get to net zero. They need someone to be sequestering that carbon. And this is where it's about collective action. So the owner, um, unless they own all the grazing rights, doesn't have the control of the vegetation there because that vegetation is being eaten by the commoners. So, again, the owner needs to be working collectively 
with the commoners. It's not about setting people against each other. It's saying, how can we all collectively find the way forward that delivers both for our businesses um, and we're delivering public goods and being paid for that. Now, in terms of suddenly the carbon credits become a sort of private good because you're selling them separately and how we stack these agreements, you know, a, an ELM scheme and stacking it with a, with a carbon credit or parallel so that you're not being dual funded is, is important. But I would suggest that any owner who's thinking of going solo on this would be wise to think again because they, um, they, they won't be able to deliver without the um, participation of the commoners because they might just say, well, we're, we're not going into any scheme, we're just turning out all our sheep where you know, there would be um, erosion caused, there won't be the carbon, you know, nobody wants to be in that position. Similarly, if commoners go solo without the owner, then that's not in their interests either. But it is a bit of a wild west carbon credits at the moment. It's a market that hasn't matured and we we'll need to have more codes and what we're really also asking is that DEFRA when they look at the SFI 22 is that we produce data of a quality that can then be used for developing carbon credits as well as ELM. Um, there's no point just doing something that you know you'd ask your kid to do for a GCSE you know project. As Mike pointed out the level of detail required is very very high. Do you want to add anything Dave? Move on to another yeah. one? Let's move on. Yeah, so the next one was around, um, thank you Anne for that question, I think we might have already covered it around um, commoners being involved in the survey work and who will do the survey work, uh, but I think we've talked a bit about that and like you said Julie about getting the right people for the job, um, but about keeping the survey requirements simple, as simple as they can be. Um, and I've got a question from Kieran, uh, how does the work on common land with, how does this work on common land with no registered rights or no active commoners? Does the landowner get everything, including the local authorities? Um, yes. Let's put me one. <laughs> That's um. There's only one got, beneficiary. Yeah. 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 Um, so then we've got a question from Anne. Thanks, Anne. Around um, when we're assessing again, again around surveys and assessment of the condition of the common. How does the overriding condition of triple SI fit, as it would or could trump any vision? And any suggestion of what can and would be done, you know, in terms of what you, when you're coming up with your management plan. So she's saying that in an ideal world, the vision would supersede the triple SI uh, assessment. But any thoughts on that? Interested? Um, it, there's what's legally correct. So the triple SI is, in in a sense, has a almost a primacy in law because it is often these are special areas of conservation. So they were designated onto international and national law, and so what I would suggest is that you don't create a vision without considering the triple SI. So it's a bit, a bit, bit of yeah. an Irish answer. If, it was, you know, if I was going to try to get to there, I wouldn't start from the position where I hadn't considered the triple SI because you're sort of setting yourself up for failure. Um, that would just be part, I mean, a lot of the mapping we've been doing, you know, the first thing that goes on the map sort of a standard is the triple SI, isn't it? So that's just become part of the discussion from, you know, through the test and trial. So I guess it's that, isn't it? That would just be part of it from the beginning, really. And I, I think as well, Sorry, you could be here. Well, I mean, there's another bit saying whether you think um, consider the triple SI assessment is flawed. Well, if, if if you do consider it's flawed, then you'll have to get someone else in to contest. You know, you need to get a specialist to contest it to some extent. Um, if I don't know how possible that is. Um, I think there are two, are, yeah, is whether mm -hmm. the assessment is flawed or whether the notification and the features of interest are flawed. Yeah. So it might be that Anne thinks that the, that actually you're set up for failure because you're never going to get those particular species back or it's changed. And that's a case. And, and you know, there are lots of people who said that, you know, we could do things that are better than the triple SI notification. The notification is keeping things in aspic and we could do better things if we if we could have more flexibility, better things for nature and carbon and farming collectively if we weren't constrained. And that's something that I think does need to be considered. Um, and the other thing is the time scale for the recovery of the triple SI. So if natural England um, say, well, it's fine, you know, if we want, if you think of recovering a, a, it over 20 years, you might well be able to deliver lots of other things in between. If the time scale is three or four years, then you would limit your focus inevitably would be on the triple SI. And that means there were lots of other public goods and farming systems and the owner's interests, which would, would be hard to deliver. So I think understanding that these habitats should 
they've taken you know will take a long time because the marginal nature of the land the bad weather the high altitude to recover is really important I, I would totally agree with Julia on flexibility because the other thing that we need to take into consideration now is climate change and how is that actually going to affect the sort of mosaic habitats which we don't know and therefore we need some less rigidity I would suggest and more flexibility in the assessment. Another one on um, surveys for a man Blackburn, thanks Anne, <laughs> around possibly using drones, any thoughts on using drones to produce baseline surveys, would that be more effective, more cost effective? Yeah, both drones and also satellite data, so there's been some really good work going on in Dartmoor and um, on another common, and not part of this project, but part of another project, we're working, um, and, and in fact, Tracy, who's been the local facilitator in Dartmoor, is working closely with how we can use satellite data. Drones, definitely, that data can, can be used. What we need to do is, is how you analyze it. So you take the drone imagery, and then you analyze that image to see which habitat is, um, is which, and that requires a sort of algorithm, as you can imagine, converting this shade of purple to um, a dry heath and that shade of purple to a valley mire or um, so there's and the, distinguishing the different types of grass. What we found from the satellite data, I'm, I and other people may know better, it's about a 50 percent accuracy in terms of habitat. But that means that you, the good thing is you have measured everything so they can be much quicker and almost equally accurate overall. So technology is coming in and we're not quite there yet, but I would expect in the next five to 10 years, certainly on peat, natural England are expecting, I think by 2024 to have an accurate peat map from remote imagery of England. Yeah, thank you. Um, we've, um, we've got another upvot an upvoted one, Robert, Bob. So yours is at the top now. Where does farming and grazing fit in the trials? I don't know if it means into our test and trial. I guess you do, Bob. Don't, I mean, I can say, oh, go ahead, Viv, if you want to. No, you can, you go ahead, Joe. But I would just say that with all the, all the commons that we've worked, the four commons we've worked closely with in the past year on the test and trial, that has been right at the heart of what we've talked about, really, and who we've talked to. So a lot of ad and, and grazing has been a, a key part um, of each test and trial. We've talked, up, talked about whether it's... Um, well, ca cattle on Minchinhampton and common in, Cot on, in the Cotswolds and issues around TB and bringing them on and off um, to stocking rates, uh, to ponies on Dartmoor. So, I mean, grazing is, is, is an issue that we've talked about a lot with the commoners that we're working with. And obviously then how um, all of those issues fit with a longer term sustainability of a farming business and what the commons agreement brings to that farm business is really at the obviously at the forefront of people's thinking. Uh, and it's something that we've talked a lot about with the, with the commoners that we've worked with. Um, so I'd say that's a pretty key one. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you want to add anything else. But I think that's hopefully answered that one. Yeah. And then we've got another one from uh, Tony, which is a bit, uh, Tony Hockley, thanks, Tony. This is around um, the issue of transparency that you brought up, Julia, and talking about if there's any plans, should there be any plans, I guess, for public transparency once agreements are in place? Um, should they be agreements and their monitoring be available for people to see in the future? Is that, is, is, have got any thoughts on that? Um, yes, I think the short answer is that if it's not individual, I mean, at the moment on Magic, you can see a little bit about the agreements, not a huge amount. A lot of them can be FOI'd and you just simply get redacted so that the people's personal names and personal details are taken out. These, this is public money being spent in the same way if you wanted to get a contract for um, I don't know, you know, PPE equipment, you should be able to get that. There's a lot of public money going in. I think what's probably more interesting is sort of exactly what is happening in terms of delivery of public goods and the, and the maps. The problem at the moment is that often people either colour in maps or they're using, they're using whatever their own software is, they're producing a PDF and it's really hard for the DEFRA to make all that data available in an easily accessible form. But we do, there is a site called DEFRA um, data, public data service, I think it's called, where there's a lot of information. We've been using that to download information. So all the old FEP maps can be, be seen on that. So the, there will be more available and certainly it's something in the, the Elms Engagement Group with DEFRA where discussing the detail of that. But in short, yes. Yeah, 
I mean, and that's one of the things we're finding through the test and trial, isn't it? Getting hold of good data and how to save it and share it and import it from one set of software to the other is, you know, a whole test and trial in itself, isn't it? Um, okay, thanks for that. Uh, we're on 57. Uh, so maybe a couple of real quick ones and then we'll wrap up. Um, I don't, I'm not quite sure what this one means. So around the, can you see that one? From Berit, if the internal agreement specifies doing what you need to have a mechanism to vary this without having to prepare a new deed. Is, I'm not quite sure what that one is. I'm, um, I'm going to well, move on. Maybe. What I've done in the Our Commerce Association, there, there are wanted to make slight mod modifications to the, the um, internal agreement or to a clause in the current internal agreement. Basically, what we've had is, is do it at the AGM and have a proposition and to have a majority vote on it. And then it gets then it goes into the minutes of the AGM. But I mean, it depends on how substantive the issue is. Yeah, it's you can't change the front part of it by you have to get complete consensus. You can change the constitution mm -hmm. and the grazing rules, mm -hmm. rules by by majority decision. And mm -hmm. um, what we um, in terms of so the, the 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 internal agreement is usually made up of two parts, and it's the front part is everybody signing up as an individual. And you would then have to get everybody to sign up. So if, when, for instance, there's an HLS rollover and if a change is required there, what we do is a deed of variation. And that's quite short. And that gets, um, again, it is a deed. It does need a lot, but that is being done. What we then do is make sure that continues for as long as all the rollovers are going to last. So we're not having to then every year that there's an HLS rollover have to have a new deed. And we were putting a bit more flexibility around that. Um, and it's similarly, if the parties change, you can have a short deed called a deed of novation. So if you're selling your farm, you have a deed of novation and you hand on your responsibilities to the new owner. And we're going to stick to time. So we've got um, one more, well, one more quick question. Are we clear what features we are mapping plus what system DEFRA will use for monitoring? I would say that's part of what we're doing in the test and trial, isn't it? We're not, um, We've got our we've got our DEFRA public goods. We're working through that list, thinking about how we map them. We're using that as our as our starting point, uh, and we don't know yet exactly what the monitoring will be like, do we? But yeah, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. I think at the moment what we do know is that the government will be focusing for the duration of this Parliament on the public goods of nature, water, and climate, and we are not expecting there to be significant sums under SFI. Um, for other public goods. Um, this is something we feel it should be broader for the six public goods, uh, the, all the public goods that are in the Agriculture Act. Um, those will, there will some payments for things like dry stone wall under countryside stewardship, but we, um, so if you, if you think the cultural heritage is important, if you think whether it's built cultural heritage or the intangible cultural heritage of creating the landscape, then please do contact your MP. Um, but um, it's, it's really important that everybody engages and feels there's something for them. We know that people come to these beautiful places because they love the landscape. Sphagnum is really important, but most people didn't go on holiday to watch Sphagnum grow. That's a long holiday. <laughs> It is. I think, I think Mike does, judging by all the photos he's got. It is. I, that's I, I don't want to diminish because we are in a climate crisis and we do need, you know, we definitely need to do all that work. But remember, if we were to ask the public what they would like to pay for, landscape, I think, would be near the top of the list. Um, so a, a broad scheme that covers all these really key. It's not about ranking one and being more important than the other, but it is about not leaving things out. Thanks. I'm, we're going to th thanks everybody. It's a minute past nine. I'm really keen that we finish on time. So um, we'll take those questions that we've not answered and have a look at them. And if you want to drop us a, no a note on anything, you're welcome to, you know, get in touch if we've not managed to answer your question. We're going to finish with a final poll, uh, which hopefully you'll find a little bit uh, juicy in terms of what you see as the biggest challenges to managing commons. So I'll give you a, a minute or two to answer that. Um, and then we'll wrap up. So while you're doing that, just to say thanks very much to Mike, to Julia and to Viv and to Susie, who is in the background organising us all and keeping us all on track. We're planning to have another webinar like this to give you an update on what we've been doing on the test and trial and have a chat about some of the issues in December. Um, look out on the Foundation for Common Land website. We've got a, log on, a blog on there, which we update occasionally. Or we're on Twitter, just... Um, 
explaining what we're up to. If you want to get in touch, if you're interested in learning a bit more about the toolkit or what's coming, feel free to, to get in touch with us. Um, we'll keep the poll going for a couple more minutes and really appreciate everybody giving up their time to join us this evening. Thanks for engaging so much, giving us your comments and your questions. Um, and I hope you found something in there of interest. Um, one, to help you think about uh, what's coming uh, in terms of preparing for new for a new agreement, but also thanks because it's really helpful for us to hear what you think and get some feedback from you that we can feed directly into our test and trial. So we really appreciate your time and hope you found it interesting. I think anybody else going to participate in the poll? I think we're about there. Getting agreement across all parties. 79% of you find that the biggest challenge. That's really interesting in itself. So thank you for filling that in um, and for sharing that with us. We'll say good night, I think. Does anybody want to add anything before we go? No, just thank you so much to everybody. Really and I'm sorry it. we didn't get through all the questions. There's such variety, um, but we will, they will, we'll take them on board and put them in, in terms of our toolkit, won't we? Mike's come online. Hi, Mike. All right, just say goodbye. Good night. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you for the sphagnum and the peat photos. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thanks a lot. I enjoyed We're them. We're so seen it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks everybody for joining us, and uh, we'll keep you posted on the next webinar, which will be in December. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye. -bye.